I believe we can start, Robert. Please proceed. Great. So, good afternoon, or good morning on our side. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, Caitlin Schutz. Caitlin is an assistant professor at uh, McGill and uh, a great expert on dark matter, on constraining dark matter using astrophysical probes. And uh, this is what she's going to talk about. So uh, thanks for agreeing to speak, in particular since it's uh, six o'clock in the morning, uh, your time and my time. So please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Robert. Um, thanks again to the organizers for putting this together and inviting me to give this lecture. Um, yeah, like Robert said, it is uh, six in the morning here. Um, so I'm barely caffeinated and not a morning person at all. So, um, you know, if I say something that sounds really confusing, it might not be you, it might be me or the lack of caffeine. Um, so please uh, feel free to, to ask questions uh, during the lecture. Um, and as Robert mentioned, um, I think a lot about astrophysical and cosmological probes uh, of dark matter. Um, that's an extremely broad topic. Um, actually, the title of these lectures, which is just straight dark matter, is an extremely broad topic. Uh, very difficult to do uh, justice to this topic in uh, three hour and a half long lectures. So I'm going to really try my best to, um, to try to cover as much ground as I can while still trying to give a focus on the physics of the early universe, which is, of course, the theme of this summer school. So everything I'm going to talk about today is going to be uh, fairly observationally oriented, just so that we know what are the requirements for a dark matter candidate in the early universe specifically. Um, and I'm going to be trying for today to focus on early universe probes of what dark matter is doing. So I want to make sure we're kind of on the same page about uh, this question of, of what dark matter is doing and really focus on our empirical knowledge about dark matter. Uh, because I'm a theorist. Uh, I'm sure many of you in the audience are theorists. And so this empirical question may not be something that we uh, think about on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but it really is an important input uh, for guiding uh, any model building or any theoretical developments uh, on, on what dark matter is. Okay, so uh, this is the question for a good chunk of today's first lecture. So first of all, one thing that we know uh, quite well empirically about dark matter uh, is, well, first of all, we know how much regular matter there is relative to photons, okay? And we know that in a couple of different ways, we have a couple of different handles on that on different epochs in the early universe. Uh, one of those handles that we have uh, is Big Bang nucleosynthesis, okay? So BBN uh, tells us basically how much uh, ordinary matter there is relative to radiation, whoops, Sorry, I'm just getting the hang of this a little bit too. This is my first time doing this uh, funky thing here with the iPad. I'm gonna try to draw on it. Okay, so uh, in this uh, kind of flow chart that I have, which is schematically showing what happens during BBN, we have all these different pathways where we have uh, photons as inputs, for example, uh, between uh, protons and deuterium and you know, between you know, various species over here, we have photons that are involved in this, in this very complicated flow chart of different nuclear reactions in the early universe. Okay, so uh, if there's gonna be some change to the amount of photons relative to the amount of this ordinary matter, these protons, uh, that's going to be messing up this entire flow chart and it's going to change the relative abundances of different light elements in the early universe. Um, and that's something that we can measure, okay? So by measuring um, primordial abundances of these elements, we can tell how many photons were there relative to these ordinary, you know, baryonic matter components. Um, at the same time, another handle that we have, oops, the handle that we have on this question um, comes from recombination, which of course you guys have been in the summer school for, uh, you know, a week now or so. So you've heard, I'm sure, a lot about the cosmic microwave background, the CMB and the, uh, the epic of recombination, surface of last scattering. But just as a lightning recap, when we look back into the universe, um, we're also looking back in time. And since the universe is expanding, that means we're looking at a period in the universe when it was significantly hotter. And when you raise the temperature of the universe by looking back in time, eventually you reach a point where things are so hot that uh, it's quite easy for the photons in the universe to actually um, 
uh, ionize hydrogen, right? So the, the photons in the universe are hot enough so that they can rip the electrons off of a proton. Um, and so then at that point, the universe uh, undergoes a phase transition, right? So prior to that time, it's this uh, plasma, which is not transparent to light. Afterwards, it becomes a neutral gas, which is transparent to light. And that's why we see uh, the CMB. Okay, and in particular, the details of how recombination occurs uh, is actually also quite sensitive to the amount of photons relative to the amount of baryons. Okay, so uh, just to be a little bit more quantitative, when you go through this phase transition from being uh, uh, ionized plasma to being neutral, uh, that's governed by the Saha equation. So this is a very simplified version of the Saha equation, which you can use to estimate uh, when is recombination occurring? So this is just assuming that we have a one state uh, hydrogen atom over here. Okay, so what this uh, Saha equation is telling you is basically what is the fraction of free electrons? So this is the oops, free electron fraction. Okay, as a function of eta. So this eta here is the number of baryons divided by the number of photons. Okay, and the, the way that you get that, the way that you get this form of the Saha equation um, is basically by just doing ordinary thermodynamics um, where you look at the number density of different species of particles as a function of their temperature. Um, and basically you can relate the density of baryons in this, uh, in this ratio to this parameter eta. Um, and you also know that this number density of photons over here is governed by just the temperature because we know that the CMB and the primordial universe is a very, very good black body. So we can get, uh, we can insert this eta as well as the temp factors of the temperature um, to give us this relationship. So you see that if you basically uh, reduce the number of baryons uh, relative to photons, or you, you increase the number of photons, that means a smaller eta, which means that to uh, reionize the universe, or excuse me, to, to recombine the universe, um, you have to go to lower temperatures. You have to make this exponential. Uh, even bigger uh, to compensate for the smallness of this eta to get to a point where you're where you're recombining the universe. Okay, and the intuition is that the more photons you have, the more photons there are on this high energy tail um, of uh, of the Boltzmann distribution or the the um, Bose-Einstein distribution. So there's more of these high energy photons that can um, uh, that can basically uh, ionize hydrogen. You have to lower the temperature to get rid of those. Okay, so this is one effect that the number of baryons relative to the number of photons has on the CMB. Um, in practice, when you're trying to measure this parameter eta from the CMB, um, there's other effects that uh, that eta will have. Uh, the number of the amount of baryons uh, changes also some properties of the acoustic peaks. Um, I'm not going to get into that because this is not a lecture on the CMB. This is a lecture on dark matter. Um, so I just wanted to give maybe one of the most straightforward examples of how this parameter eta uh, changes and affects the CMB. Um, in practice, to extract eta from the CMB, what you do is you just run your favorite Boltzmann solver, um, whether it's CAM, whether it's CLASS, um, basically just to get out what is the CMB going to look like. You compare that to data. From that, you can extract eta. Okay. So that's another handle that we have on the relative amount of ordinary matter and photons. So we have that information from BBN. We also have that information from the CMB. Um, and those two quantities actually agree with each other very, very well. So the measured BBN value of this photon to baryon ratio, uh, it agrees with the CMB value. It's about ten, uh, six times 10 to the minus 10, okay? So that's great. We know how many photons there are relative to baryons, but at the same time, we also know quite precisely when was the epoch of matter radiation equality. Um, that's one of the best measured parameters because that comes from uh, knowing about this, whoops, knowing about this peak in the matter power spectrum. So this peak over here uh, essentially comes from the transition from when you have a, a radiation dominated uh, epoch and perturbations are trying to grow in a radiation background. And then comparing that to what happens when you have a matter dominated epoch and matter perturbations are growing in a matter dominated background. So that leaves this imprint on the matter power spectrum from the transfer functions. You get this nice peak here. Uh, in the matter power spectrum. So we know exactly how much uh, matter there is relative to radiation independently from how, how we know how much baryons there is relative to radiation, okay? And the upshot um, is that, 
whoops. Sorry, I'm still getting the hang of this a little bit. Uh, the upshot is that the amount of matter does not match the amount of baryons. Okay, so there simply is not enough baryonic matter content in the universe um, to explain how much matter we see in the early universe. Okay, so this is a one piece of evidence for dark matter. Uh, it may not be the most familiar piece of evidence. You know, maybe you've heard things about rotation curves, but again, I'm trying to really keep this early universe focused. Okay, so this information tells you. Uh, the upshot is that there was a non-baryonic component of matter that was present in the early universe, okay? Um, so at least as early as the time of recombination um, and consistent with what was happening also at the epoch of BBN. So naturally that, rise, you know, the question arises, what was this non-baryonic component of matter doing in the early universe? Um, for example, one very well-posed question you can ask about this non-baryonic matter component is, what was its thermal history, All right? So everything uh, you know, we know about the very early universe directly, we know from BBN, right? Which is a, a very thermal process, right? We're used to thinking about uh, you know, thermodynamics in this context in the early universe. So does dark matter have its own unique version of that story? And the, you know, it, it can really vary. So it really depends on what, what this dark matter is. Um, you can have various interactions between the dark matter and the standard model. So here I'm just showing a Feynman diagram, but with all of the time arrows pointing different directions, you can, um, this is the so-called make it, shake it, break it diagram. Um, the dark matter can be doing interesting things and having interesting contact with the thermal plasma of the early universe. Uh, you can envision that perhaps dark matter could be in its own separate sector, uh, which could potentially a uh, couple, uh, couple with the standard model. So it could thermalize either chemically or kinetically. Um, entropy can in principle transfer between the two sectors um, and dark matter can be born in this way through the thermal processes. Alternatively, it can be born through non-thermal processes. So there, this is a really wide open question. We can actually make some uh, pretty robust statements though about uh, what is not allowed to happen through this, th this process, through this thermal history. So for example, uh, returning to BBN, uh, we actually have fairly good constraints from BBN on the number of relativistic degrees of freedom uh, during the epoch that's relevant for BBN. So at temperatures roughly corresponding to one MeV. Okay, so uh, in particular, BBN is sensitive to the Hubble expansion rate during that epoch uh, because the Hubble expansion rate is basically the, the clock which determines uh, the relative importance of different nuclear processes um, basically freezing out or you know various decay processes being relevant. So if you change Hubble, you end up changing the amount of lead elements that we see in that complicated flow chart that I showed you before. And since BBN is happening during a radiation dominated epoch, uh, the way that you change Hubble is, is that you change the radiation density. Okay, so here is a, a parameterization of how people often refer to the radiation density, they will often parameterize it in terms of this N effective over here. Now in the standard model, this value is very, very close to three, right? So you'll see that you have these funny factors of seven eighths and four elevenths to the four thirds over here. Um, that's accounting for the fact that by the onset of BBN, uh, we're assuming that neutrinos uh, have kinetically decoupled from the standard model and that E plus E minus pairs have left the bath and have heated them up a little bit. And if those two processes happened sequentially and were separated very much in time, then this N effective would be three. Um, instead, it's more like 3.046, just because uh, the decoupling of neutrinos and the uh, E plus E minus freeze out from the bath happen at similar enough times that there's some amount of overlap. So there is some amount, there's some extent to which the E plus E minus pairs do heat up the neutrinos just a little bit. Okay, so that's why that an effective value in the standard model is not three. And we can measure from BBN that this parameter has to be very close to its standard model value. So within one sigma of its standard model value. And so given that, we know that there can't be any additional contributions to an effective, uh, basically aside from what we think of as being vanilla neutrinos in the standard model, okay? So anything that was around during that time that was extra beyond just photons and neutrinos of the standard model, anything that was extra cannot have been contributing to rho radiation over here. 
Okay, so whatever was around, for example, dark matter, it cannot have been relativistic and it cannot have had a thermal abundance. Those two things cannot simultaneously be true. Otherwise, you're going to change rho radiation and you're going to change Hubble. So the upshot of what that means uh, is that if dark matter is lighter than roughly one MeV, which is again, the relevant temperature scale for BBN, that's the scale that determines whether or not the dark matter is relativistic and whether it's contributing to radiation or not. Um, if dark matter is lighter than the scale, then it can't be thermalized with standard model bath. Because if it's thermalized, it's gonna have a thermal abundance, a high abundance comparable to the photons or comparable to the neutrinos, uh, and it's gonna contribute to rho radiation. Um, and this is a really strong constraint on many kinds of dark matter models and many kinds of theories of dark matter where you have some interaction between the dark matter and the standard model, which is setting the relic abundance. Um, it depends a little bit on the properties of the mediator and exactly how that interaction happens. Um, but here's a recent example from just last year by Giovanetti et al, uh, basically showing, you know, for a couple of different uh, nice theories of dark matter, uh, like, for example, having scalar, uh, uh, complex scalar freeze out or asymmetric dark fermions, um, you can actually set a constraint. Anything down here in this region of the parameter space um, is excluded. OK, so if this dark matter is thermal and if it's talking to the standard model, if it were down here, it would contribute to radiation. So that's excluded. So that's a, a quite strong uh, constraint, right? This, this plot could, in principle, go all the way down to you know, zero, basically, and it would still be excluded. So that's very powerful. Um, alternatively, you can make statements like, uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. You can make statements like, if dark matter is thermalized with the standard model plasma, oh, no, sorry. These two points are the same. That's a typo on my part. Um, so the other bullet point, which was meant to be here, and sorry, it's 6 a.m. for me again, so uh, you know, bear with me. But the other point that was meant to be here is that if dark matter is lighter than an MeV, uh, oh, sorry, this is here. Again, it's 6 a.m. for me. Please, apolo apologies, please bear with me. Uh, if dark matter is lighter than an MeV, it can't, uh, it can't be thermalized with the plasma, okay? So you can actually have theories of of dark matter where that's true, where the dark matter is lighter than an MeV, it's just not thermalized, okay? All right, so hopefully that's clear. Hopefully I didn't confuse anyone. Uh, we can actually take this actually a step further. Um, so for example, we can get more information about the thermal history by looking at really, really small dark matter halos, okay? And just to illustrate that point, um, here's a plot that's slightly out of date, but I think it illustrates, whoops, I think it illustrates this point really well. Okay, so this is a plot showing the uh, dimensionless matter power spectrum delta squared as a function of wave number k, and matching that wave number k onto basically the characteristic size of halos up here. So for example, uh, this is sort of a scale where you have galactic dark matter halos, um, which we have evidence for, for from a number of different uh, probes. And basically the information that we have uh, that we've measured is in this white region, okay? So we've measured scales um, going all the way down to 10 to the 10 or so solar masses. Um, actually this plot is a little out of date. So we've actually gone maybe in order of magnitude or so beyond this. So we, we've now started probing into this region, but I think this illustrates the point quite nicely and may not be so obvious uh, what's the connection to the early universe just because when we're probing, uh, very small dark matter halos, we're typically doing that at the present day. However, um, in this region of the plot, these modes uh, that we are starting to probe more and more, and we're, we're getting deeper into this region, those modes entered the horizon at a redshift of around 10 to the 7. So when the universe was roughly at KeV temperatures, okay, so um, if we continue to measure these modes in this part of the, uh, in, in this, at this length scale, and if it continues to be consistent with cold dark matter, then whatever that, um, you know, whatever dark matter was doing in the early universe, we know then that by redshift 10 to the seven, it had to be doing stuff that was pretty boring, okay? It can't be acting funny, otherwise, because those modes are in the horizon, inside of the horizon, if dark matter is doing something weird, uh, those modes can in principle get messed up somehow, okay? So for example, um, one example of how modes can get messed up is through, um, you know, if dark matter decouples while it's relativistic, 
Okay, so this may be um, an example um, that maybe people have seen before. Um, you know, if neutrinos, if you take neutrinos seriously as a dark matter candidate, as people did when dark matter was first, you know, taken seriously as an idea in the 70s, um, then, you know, neutrinos, we already know how they act. We know that they decouple from the standard model while they're relativistic. And so then we can predict what is the abundance of neutrinos, for example, um, depending on their temperature relative to the standard model. And so you can take that same sort of story and just say, well, what if it's not neutrinos? What if it's some other thing? So I'll put in the mass of this thing and the temperature of this thing as a free parameter. Okay, but the thermodynamics um, of, of this particle and, and it's decoupling while relativistic still tell me how much of this stuff that there has to be. So if you know this quantity over here, um, then you can uh, infer a relationship between the mass of something that decouples while relativistic and its temperature. Okay, so this temperature ratio is generally determined from entropy considerations. So, you know, if it's in contact with some bath and then it leaves that bath and then that bath continues to evolve and heat itself up, that's what determines this temperature ratio. Okay, so for um, the kind of bounds that are quoted on this scenario today, which are at the KEV scale, um, there actually needs to be roughly a thousand or even closer to 10,000 degrees of freedom to give you the temperature ratio that you would need over here for KEV scale dark matter to explain the abundance of dark matter that we see. So this kind of model is often quoted as a benchmark. People will constrain uh, this situation, warm dark matter, um, but it's not to be taken too literally, I don't think, um, just because we don't have a thousand degrees of freedom in the standard model to dilute the temperature. So you would have to explain where does that come from? So maybe don't take this model too literally, but um, there are a lot of really good analogies in other theories of dark matter um, where you have similar initial conditions in terms of the temperature. Uh, for example, sterile neutrinos uh, are, are a good example where you have similar uh, initial conditions. Okay, so this is, this is one way in which you can mess up what things are doing at redshift 10 to the seven. So in particular, uh, when you have these initial conditions, um, because you know if, if dark matter is born with a pretty hot temperature and it's pretty light, um, then the typical RMS velocity scales like the square root of temperature over mass. So if it's if it's hot and it's light, then that means it's going to be going pretty fast um, for a longer time as the universe is evolving. And if it's going too fast, then you're going to wash out uh, the formation of small scale structure. Okay, so here's an example uh, of two simulations. Um, and one of them has warm dark matter, but it's heavier and cooler. This other one has a lighter, hotter candidate. You can see that a lot of the structure uh, is being erased on small scales. Um, that's because as these nascent structures are trying to collapse and trying to, to pull in dark matter and grow, um, if that dark matter is moving too fast, um, it's not going to be able to capture that dark matter. Okay, so in other words, the uh, escape velocity of these nascent structures uh, is too small compared to the typical RMS dark matter velocity. So the dark matter is not being gravitationally captured by these nascent uh, structures. So dark matter is just going to keep free streaming. It doesn't, it doesn't care that these structures are there. Um, and that's obviously quite different from the picture on the left. So if you're erasing these modes with this very um, small escape velocity, you're going to wash, wash things out. Everything looks fuzzed out in the picture on the right. And so that's one way that we're sensitive to what's happening in the very early universe uh, when these particles would have been free streaming. Okay. So we have a lot of ways of probing this using cosmology. Um, probably one of the most well-studied ways is using the Lyman alpha forest. Um, what that is, is basically we look at some high redshift. Uh, so in this case, uh, high redshift here means like redshift five or six uh, quasar. You always have to specify what you mean by high redshift because different communities mean very different things. Since this is a physics of the early universe, uh, summer school or winter school, excuse me, um, this may not seem very high redshift, but from the point of view of an astronomer, this is quite high redshift. Um, you're looking at these, uh, these quasars, they have some intrinsic uh, sort of broad spectrum that looks something like this. It's, it's intrinsically smooth. And then as the light from this quasar travels to our telescopes, uh, it passes through the cosmic web, uh, it passes through all these neutral clumps of hydrogen gas, and every time it does that, um, some Lyman alpha photons are absorbed by that gas. 
And now because this light is traveling over cosmological uh, time scales, the entire universe is redshifting and expanding. So this entire spectrum is moving to the right, which means that every time a new clump of hydrogen is encountered, there's some new pristine part of the spectrum, which previously was at uh, too short of a wavelength, but now has been redshifted to be the appropriate wavelength such that these photons can be absorbed through the Lyman alpha transition. And at the end of the day, we're left with this dense forest of spectral lines we call the Lyman alpha forest. And it tells you uh, about how much structure there was along the line of sight for the photons traveling along that path. Okay, so every one of those uh, absorption features corresponds to a little clump of uh, neutral hydrogen gas along the line of sight. And if you have something messing up, uh, you know, the early universe clustering in the early universe, you're going to mess up this Lyman alpha forest. You're going to basically erase a bunch of these absorption features. Um, another really great handle that we have on this um, is through looking at uh, these so-called dwarf galaxies or these, these sub halos. Uh, these are systems where uh, dark matter is like really the dominant component of the mass, uh, upwards of 99% of the mass of these systems. Um, so this example is Eridanus II. Uh, it's the kind of dwarf galaxy, you know, if you blink, you might miss it, um, which is why it took so long for it to be discovered. It was only discovered uh, in the last decade or so. And we have, you know, increasing uh, evidence for more and more of these kinds of systems that are really dark matter dominated. So just to give a sense for that, uh, we've been finding more and more new dwarf galaxies over time, and here they're co uh, color coded according to uh, which uh, surveyor, which telescope actually discovered them. Uh, and you can see over here that uh, so DES, which is these uh, red triangles, uh, the field of view is is marked by this red kind of funky looking red region. Uh, and DES has discovered in the past two to three years uh, a number of new uh, dwarf galaxies. So we're finding more and more of these very, very faint, uh, very, you know, dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. We're finding more and more of them all the time. And importantly, uh, again, if you're messing up, you know, so going back a few slides, uh, if you're messing up what's happening in the early universe, you're messing up clustering you're going to basically affect the formation of these very, very small uh, dark matter halos, right? You're going to potentially erase them if you mess with the, with the cosmology too much. So the fact that we find an abundance uh, of these dwarf galaxies means that whatever was happening in the early universe cannot have erased them. Kathleen, there's uh, a question in yes. the chat box from ah, okay. Robert. Yeah, it asks, uh, do we probe the Lyman alpha forest signature in terms of a power spectrum? The power spectrum is which is usually shown on a P of K plot? Yes, we do. Uh, good question. Um, maybe I can go back to an earlier slide. Uh, so here, uh, for example, yes, we do probe it via the power spectrum. Uh, the purple points, for example, show the boss year nine Lyman alpha forest. So yes. Okay. Uh, was, there, was there another question or? No, there was no, other, there has been no other questions. Yeah. Great, okay. Great, thanks for the question. So yes, anyway, as I was saying, we've discovered more and more of uh, these dwarf galaxies. Um, they tell us that whatever was happening in the very early universe, um, you know, when these modes entered the horizon, it kind of messed up the formation of these very small dwarf galaxies. Um, we're getting better and better at understanding this point quantitatively, so, of course, you know, these are uh, little mini galaxies, so there's going to be some complicated astrophysics that you have to understand. Um, we've been doing that better and better by understanding the so-called galaxy halo connection uh, in a more empirical way. So what you can do is you can re-simulate uh, different, cos under different cosmologies, you can re-simulate uh, Milky Way-like halos from a cosmological volume, paint on the galaxies according to some uh, model that, that matches the, the galaxy that you observe to the halo that it lives inside. Um, you apply any selection criteria from your observations. So observations are always going to have some sort of uh, selection biases that you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you're not biasing your conclusions because of those biases. So you want to apply those. Um, and then you want to basically calculate the likelihood of what you observe versus the underlying model, and then rinse and repeat until you converge on something where you have some handle on both the underlying properties of the galaxies from your cosmological volume under 
your cosmology, and you separately have some information about the galaxy halo connection, because these two things are are sufficiently not degenerate with, with each other that you can actually constrain both of them at the same time. And so that's what folks have been increasingly doing. Okay, so what we're finding more and more over time is that the presence of low mass subhalos that we infer from seeing these dwarf galaxies uh, is indeed consistent with the predictions of cold dark matter. So that's pretty powerful. There's also a no number of other uh, ways that we can probe very, very small scales. Um, and these different ways are uh, either in their infancy or maybe in their adolescence. So getting more and more mature. Um, but I really think a lot of these probes are quite right for improving our understanding of what was happening in the early universe. Again, just to reiterate, because the smallest scales um, or the smallest halos correspond to the smallest scales, which means that those modes entered the horizon very early. So by probing smaller and smaller scales, we're probing modes that entered the horizon earlier and earlier in time. Okay. So a couple of uh, methods that people have been using that are getting increasingly good include things like uh, looking at gravitationally lensed quasars. So uh, here, for example, in this image, uh, this is an example of a, a single quasar seen by Hubble, but it's just been quadruply lensed by a foreground galaxy. Um, and in particular, this doesn't look like a perfect X, right? There's some wobble to how these uh, four different images appear. And that is actually coming from a uh, substructure in the lens galaxy. So if you have some, you know, little dark matter halos populating all around in this, in this galaxy, it's going to affect the positions and the relative fluxes of these four images because these four images are sensitive to second derivatives of the lensing potential. Okay, so this has been an increasingly powerful probe. So here's a, a couple of references if you're interested, um, but these have been um, getting increasingly good. If you wanna quote them in terms of how they're constraining warm dark matter, we're getting up to like six KeV constraints with this method. Uh, another way that you can use to look for very, very low mass dark matter subhalos uh, is by looking at dynamically cold stellar streams. So for example, there's the, the GD1 stream here, um, and you can see it has these like funny features in it. Um, there, you know, These streams are basically formed when you have some globular cluster or some dwarf galaxy and it's falling into the Milky Way. And it experiences a pretty strong tidal force as it's uh, falling in. And what that tidal force does is it rips apart uh, the globular cluster. Um, but because of Liouville's theorem, in the process of ripping apart this thing, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna rip it apart in space, then that means that in velocity space, the motion has to get more coherent. You have to preserve the 60 phase space volume. And so these things uh, end up being quite uniform and dynamically cold, all moving in the same coherent direction. So if you have any features like these ones, that implies the perturber. So this is the data, the observation, and this is a, a model where you take uh, some stream of stars and you throw uh, a dark matter perturber at it. So in particular, you throw a halo uh, with this rough, this mass and these rough properties. Okay, so that can actually mess up these stellar streams. And by inferring, um, you know, either the absence or the presence of these properties in the stream, uh, you can actually infer the presence of dark substructure. Um, was there a question? Another question? Yes, I had a question. Uh, can you explain again the axes in this plot? Ah, yes, of course. So these are actually the axes uh, as they appear on the sky. So this is, um, I guess, 2D spherical coordinates in a sense. So um, this is actually, you know, to map this on to dis like physical distances, you need to deproject it. So uh, that's a little bit complicated and it depends on um, things on measurements that have uncertainties. That's why people typically don't show it. Um, but the point being is that if you have something uh, traveling transverse uh, to the stream, so I guess coming into or out of the slide, so I guess in the direction, moving in the direction of my laser pointer, um, then it can actually gravitationally perturb these stars and, and it can drag them out of the stream. Does that, uh, does that help clarify? Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. I wanna make sure things are clear, so that's great. Um, okay, so that's another really promising method. Uh, in, for example, uh, Bonnick et al, 2019, um, you know, folks have been starting to set limits, again, mapping onto warm dark matter. That's kind of the typical um, benchmark model that people like to constrain. Uh, like I mentioned before, probably not to be taken too seriously as a literal model of dark matter, but 
Um, it's one that's very convenient and that's been widely used. So people uh, concerning uh, dark matter with stellar streams are getting to the level of, again, like six, six or seven keV. Um, so that's it's getting quite good. A couple of other methods I want to just mention, uh, lightning fast. Uh, if you have a uh, disruption of small scale halos, uh, those small scale halos are the, are the likeliest places for the first stars to form in a hierarchical bottom up picture of structure formation. Um, and so if you don't have these halos, you can actually uh, delay the onset of the first stars. Uh, and that can actually affect the signals that you would see from cosmic dawn and reionization. So in 21 centimeter uh, radiation, that could affect things. And um, Munoz et al. Uh, 2019 showed this is actually a very promising method to constrain what's happening on very small scales. Um, going to even smaller scales. So uh, now talking about things where you know there's no hope of ever seeing an optical counterpart or a visible counterpart. Um, you can have microlensing near the caustics of lensing clusters. You can have astrometric lensing. You can look for signatures on nearby stars, for example, coming from stellar wakes of things moving around in a field of stars or looking at correlated proper accelerations. So this is getting to be an increasingly rich area. Um, and I think it's quite exciting, again, because it means you're probing uh, earlier and earlier into the universe. OK, so um, the upshot of everything I just said is that so far, all of our observations are consistent with cold dark matter. So when it comes to how things are clustering, it's all consistent with cold dark matter. So that means that whatever dark matter's thermal history was, um, by roughly redshift 10 to the seven, it had to basically start behaving like it was cold dark matter. So it had to be behaving rather in a rather boring way, okay? So that's a pretty strong constraint to put on your theories of dark matter. Um, so it's gonna be one that we're gonna incorporate throughout these lectures. Okay, here's another question about what dark matter is doing in the early universe. Again, we know it's there, um, but is it interacting very much? Is it doing anything interesting, right? We just saw through the thermal history that, you know, whatever it's doing thermally can't be too interesting, but, but maybe it's having some other, you know, subtle interactions that are having other subtle ramifications in the early universe. And that's another question that we can address empirically. One way that we can address this question empirically is by um, considering, you know, what's happening in the pre-recombination photon barrier fluid. Okay, so prior to recombination, uh, we have um, some spectrum of perturbations in the gravitational potential uh, that was laid down by some theory of the early universe that you guys have been covering in previous lectures in this in this school, right? So whatever, pick your favorite theory of the early universe. It's going to lay down some spectrum of seed fluctuations in the potential. And then um, as the universe evolves, those tiny fluctuations can grow because gravity is attractive and things are going to start to fall into those potentials. OK, so that's what's happening in the early universe. Uh, in particular, matter is trying to cluster. It's trying to fall into these uh, potentials that were laid down from this early universe theory. And so things want to cluster and grow. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, radiation pressure is, uh, you know, quite a force to contend with in the early universe because, you know, here you have uh, this very tightly coupled photon baryon fluid where the photons and the baryons schematically shown like this in this picture are interacting all the time. The mean free path is very, very short. Okay, so these baryons can try to cluster and try to fall down into this gravitational potential well under the influence of gravity. But radiation pressure is going to tend to try to smear things out. Okay, so you have these two competing effects, and these are the ingredients that you essentially need um, to source a sound wave in the early universe, um, right? You have gravity providing compression and you have radiation pressure providing rarefaction. And this is the genesis of uh, baryon acoustic oscillations that we observe in the CMB. Now, uh, as a part of this- oh, Kathleen, yes. there is a question uh, from Robert, ah. uh, uh, wondering okay. whether you, he's wondering whether you are assuming the, the, the dark matter particles were thermally produced? In this picture, uh, no, I'm not. Um, okay. It's related to what you said before, that uh, dark matter looks like standard cold dark matter. Um, yeah, that, that statement is independent of how it was produced. Yeah, so whatever dark, however dark matter was produced, be it thermally or non-thermally or, or whatever mechanism, it has to look uh, walk, talk, act like cold dark matter, 
by roughly redshift 10 to the seven. So yeah, whatever it was doing before, we don't have any information, but, um, but yeah, by, by late times, it has to be acting effectively like cold dark matter, effectively. But it's not, it's not the um, WIMP cold dark matter. Correct. Okay. That, that's... Yeah, so it has to, it has to cluster like cold dark matter, but as to its microphysical properties, um, we don't have enough information to tell just, just from the information I've presented so far. Yeah. So does that clarify? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. There is another question from Deep Ghosh. Uh, Deep, unmute and ask your question, please. So hello, my question is about the Lyman Alpha Forest. So the point is from Lyman Alpha Forest, we know the uh, lower mass of the dark matter is around, I think, uh, tens of KV. So my question, uh, my question is, uh, uh, in that case, the dark matter is thermalized or if, if that's so, so then it uh, clashes with BBN or not? Good question. So um, the statement that you just made, uh, maybe I can go back. The statement you just made, um, so the warm dark matter constraint uh, from the Lyman Alpha Forest is around 5 keV. So yeah, like getting closer to 10 keV. Um, however, those constraints uh, depend on assuming these initial conditions. So generically, this is not gonna apply to other theories of dark matter that have different initial conditions from this. So actually in practice, what you wanna do, and I was gonna get into this actually in a, in a later lecture, but in practice, what you wanna do is you wanna make statements that uh, basically match at the level of what is the clustering that you would see. Okay, so um, as, I, you know, as I mentioned here, you probably don't wanna take this theory of dark matter too seriously because you need you know, thousands of degrees of freedom in the standard model to give you the appropriate temperature ratio here for 10 keV scale dark matter. Um, so this is just a this is just a toy model. But uh, as we'll see, there's other constraints on on the dark matter's mass. Does no, that clarify? No, my, my question is that you said that dark matter can be thermalized only when its mass is greater than MeV, isn't it? You, you, That's correct. So, so now my question is now when you talk about warm dark matter, so this uh, dark matter thermalized or not? So if thermalized- It was then... not thermalized, yeah. So you have to, yeah, so good question. So you have to be very careful about saying it's thermalized because it's, it's not a binary statement, right? You can be thermalized or not thermalized, but at different epochs. So from BBN, we know that the dark matter cannot have been thermal, uh, thermalized with the standard model at that epoch. So at sort of MeV temperatures, um, but so for this sort of KeV mass dark matter, um, it can be thermal, but it has to be thermal earlier and decouple while it's still relativistic. So by the time of BBN, it's not relativistic anymore. Okay. In other words, it's, its temperature ratio gets diluted by subsequent things happening in the standard model bath. But um, uh, if, if it is KeV, then... Uh it should be uh, relativistic at the time of any uh, at the time of BBN. No, only if the only if the temperature of that particle is the same as the temperature of the standard model bath. So if I agree, if a, if there's a keV mass particle that has a temperature of MeV, it will certainly be relativistic, and you will certainly have a problem. But the statement here is that this temperature ratio is quite different uh, from from unity. It's not unity. It's 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 orders of magnitude different. Oh, so so uh, the point is, is that this KeV scale particle, KeV mass particle at the time of BBN is going to have a temperature in its own sector that is significantly less than an MeV. So uh, so that means in turn, oh, we can put a bound on the temperature of the dark sector itself. Isn't That's it? correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so if you want, you can actually take this picture and you can recast it. Um, so if you don't want to assume these initial conditions, that's totally fine. You, if you don't want to assume warm dark matter, that's totally fine. Um, you can recast this as a as a limit on basically the the RMS velocity or the or the free streaming length, and that is a more model. That's a more model independent way of looking at it. And so in doing that, you're essentially constraining the mass to temperature ratio, where temperature here. Uh, by temperature, I mean dark sector temperature. So you're constraining that ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Happy to clarify. Yeah. Oops.
Okay. All right, going back. Right, I was here talking about this pre recombination fluid. Right. Sorry, maybe let me step back because we've, uh, you know, been thinking about uh, this other thing for a few minutes now. Let me just uh, go back and remind you of the picture here. We're trying to suss out whether or not there could be any more subtle effects of dark matter um, interacting in the early universe. Okay. And one of the best handles that we have on that is what's happening to uh, the perturbations in this fluid. Again, we have this competing effects between gravity and radiation pressure. Gravity wants to uh, create compressions, bring things together. Radiation pressure wants to create rare, rare factions and smooth things out. Okay, so um, in this picture, uh, in the standard sort of dark matter picture, we have collisionless dark matter, which doesn't feel radiation pressure. So it's not part of this tightly coupled photon baryon fluid. Um, it's only really feeling the effects of gravity. Um, and so in doing so, it's able to sort of be separated from uh, the photon baryon fluid. So they get physically separated from each other. Um, and the collisionless dark matter is able to just cluster purely under gravity, uh, whereas the photon baryon fluid is not. Photon baryon fluid is undergoing these oscillations, whereas the dark matter density mode is only growing. And we can actually see this, we see evidence for this in the CMB, because the fact that you have this dark matter mode down here that's growing, um, and it's sinking down to the bottom of the gravitational potential, that in turn is going to have an impact on this photon baryon fluid because this collisionless dark matter down here is steepening essentially the gravitational potential. And it's basically tur turning the scales in favor of gravity, right? So the fact that you have this dark matter here, it's, it's loading down or it's pulling down on the photon baryon fluid gravitationally. Um, that's actually one of the best measures that we have uh, on dark matter. In particular, when you see, you know, plots uh, sort of like this one, you know, showing the sort of pie chart of how much of the matter in the universe is comprised of dark matter versus ordinary matter. Um, this is one of the best ways of actually measuring that. The manifestation that that has on the CMB in terms of the anisotropies is that it makes the odd peaks of the CMB. So this is like the first and the third, even the fifth peak. Um, those are the compression peaks, and those peaks get enhanced relative to the even peaks, so the second, fourth, and so on, um, because the even peaks are the rare faction peaks, okay? So the fact that you have this dark matter here uh, means that you have more compression, so you have stronger odd peaks in the CMB uh, because of the effects of gravity. But now, suddenly, let me introduce some interaction or maybe some dark force um, that's going to maybe just very mildly couple uh, the dark matter to the photon baryon fluid just a little bit. Okay, and this idea was uh, put forward as far as I know for the first time in this 2013 paper by Cora Dvorkin and others. Okay, so if this is the case, then every once in a while, this photon baryon fluid is going to drag this dark matter. Uh, it's gonna be able to drag it out from the bottom of the gravitational potential. And now this dark matter stuff is sitting out here Whereas previously in the collisionless picture, it would have been sitting down here. And that actually is gonna leave a very distinct impact on the acoustic peaks that we see in the CMB um, for the reasons I outlined already, right? So now it's no longer the case that you have as much matter down here loading down and weighing down these baryons. So you're gonna affect the compression. And if you think about the subsequent phases of things falling in and, and you know, being rarefied out and falling in again, the fact that you have a shallower gravitational potential means that all of these uh, effects that are happening or all of these compressions and rarefactions are less crisp than they would have been before. Um, and so you're going to see less variance in the cosmic microwave background. So you're going to be suppressing basically the fluctuation uh, power spectrum that you see in a particular way. Uh, in detail, you know, this actually depends a lot on the properties of how this dark matter is interacting with this photon baryon fluid. Um, and the CMB is especially good at constraining theories of dark matter where the scattering is due to a light mediator. Okay, so here in this plot, um, this is from, again, Cora Dvorkin's paper 2013. Um, the y-axis here is showing uh, the dimensionless drag rate. So this is the arc high, and it's in units of Hubble time. Okay, or Hubble rate, excuse me. So anything on this plot that's bigger than one, so anything bigger than unity, anything up here uh, is telling you that this drag is happening on scales that is faster than a Hubble time. So it's gonna be relevant to the dynamics. And uh, this drag rate depends on this parameter N here where this N 
is telling you how the uh, cross sections of the interaction scale with velocity. So here, the cross sections scale like some constant sigma naught times V to the N. And you can see here that for the uh, red shifts that are relevant uh, for the CMB, roughly 10 to the three, this N to the minus four guy over here is gonna have the strongest drag rate, dimensionless drag rate. Um, and so that's telling you it's gonna have the strongest effect on what's happening uh, during recombination. So the CMB is really, really good at constraining these kinds of theories. The CMB constraints alone uh, currently are at the level of 10 to the minus 41 centimeters squared on this sigma naught. So extremely, extremely tight constraints on how dark matter and baryons are interacting in the early universe. Um, another uh, handle that we have on this question uh, actually, again, comes from uh, small scale dark matter clustering because Maybe let me go back again. Whoops, let me go back. Back to this picture. Um, if the, uh, you know, if the effects of this drag are really, really strong, so if your dimensionless uh, drag rate is really, really high, um, then you have the capability of potentially actually erasing uh, modes that are inside the horizon uh, at these times. So if I go to this plot, if I look at, for example, the, let me show the, let, let's focus on the n equals two case, okay? n equals two, you can see this has a very steep scaling uh, with redshift. So at very, very early times, uh, at redshifts at and above 10 to the seven, this drag rate is gonna be huge. So any modes that were inside the horizon at that time have the potential to be erased by this effect. Okay, so um, if that's the case, you're gonna see an effect in the transfer function. This is the, uh, ratio of the collisional uh, dark matter case compared to the usual collisionless cold dark matter case. You can see that at large scales, the two agree, the power spectra agree, the, the ratio is one. But at small scales, again, going to high K, uh, you see a, a steep suppression in the matter power spectrum for this case of this collisional dark matter. Uh, again, if you want to, because that's what's often done, you can map this onto uh, warm dark matter but the genesis of this effect is completely different from the thermal history. So it's a completely different effect. Um, and it depends on what this cross section is. Here I'm showing what these transfer functions look like for the velocity independent scattering case. But for all of the various ends that I showed in the previous slide, you're gonna have your own version of that transfer function. So you're gonna have you know, things, you know, for example, n equals two, you can get acoustic oscillations over here, et cetera, okay? And what that translates to is, again, if you're erasing uh, information on these small scales that like we talked about, which we're able to now measure uh, better and better over time, you can say, OK, well, if we measure stuff on these scales, then this suppression cannot have been true. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these structures to measure. OK, so you can basically take that and convert it to a constraint on how strongly dark matter is interacting uh, with ordinary matter in the early universe. Okay, so that's what this constraint looks like. Here's the, uh, the log of the dark matter cross section in centimeters squared as a function of the log of the dark matter mass. So you can see that these constraints are applicable over an extremely broad range of dark matter masses um, and can basically be complementary to uh, direct detection probes, which are shown in gray over here. Okay, so that's, that's quite powerful. And uh, this analogy of dark matter interacting with baryons um, sort of holds true also if you imagine dark matter interacting with itself. Okay, so if you have really strong dark center, sector interactions, or for example, if you have, um, you know, some more complicated dark matter where maybe you have dark forces or dark radiation, dark force carriers, um, if the dark matter is interacting with that, those dark force carriers, then you get dark acoustic oscillations. Again, it's going to look kind of like this, but with some bumps and wiggles over here. Uh, that is similarly constrained, okay? There's another constraint we have on dark matter self-interactions, um, which, you know, it's kind of complementary to this story, and it may not be at first obvious uh, why it's applicable to the early universe, but here's a picture of the bullet cluster. It's one of the most famous pieces of evidence uh, for dark matter that's um, collisionless and non-baryonic. Um, effectively, what we're seeing here is a composite image. So on the one hand, you have uh, the bulk of matter, you can infer where it is using gravitational lensing. And we see that with gravitational lensing, bulk of the matter is in these blue blobs. However, 
Uh, we can also see where the ordinary matter is in this picture uh, because it's basically thermally emitting X-rays. So you can observe this with Chandrasekhar uh, X-ray Space Telescope. Uh, uh, and basically the fact that you have these galaxy clusters that are merging at a thousand kilometers per second or so uh, means that you're able to uh, take this large bulk kinetic energy and convert that to a very large thermal energy, which is why you're emitting so strongly in such a high, uh, high energy uh, range, okay? So just to visualize this a little bit better, because you know it can be a little bit hard to visualize just using words, um, here's kind of a, an artist's sort of schematic of how this process would proceed. Okay, so here are the two blobs, the pink and the blue, prior to the merger. Um, and then you see what happens during the merger. These two blobs pass through each other as they're merging. And something different happens to the blue versus to the pink, right? You see that the pink, uh, the two pink regions, get slowed down relative to their blue counterparts. Okay, so what's going on there? Uh, what's going on is that the stuff in this pink region, the baryons, uh, it experiences a collisional drag. So in other words, the fact that on a microscopic level, uh, the baryons are able to interact with each other and scatter, and in doing so transfer energy and momentum, um, the two blobs are actually mutually slowing themselves down relative to each other, okay? So this pink blob and this pink blob, they're slowing each other down. Um, and that's not the case for whatever is in this blue blob, okay? Whatever is in this blue blob is not being slowed down. It's just proceeding through as if nothing was affecting it, only gravity, okay? So because nothing's slowing it down, we can then uh, say, okay, well, it must have not experienced this collisional drag force and therefore we can use that to set an upper limit uh, on how much this thing can be scattering either with itself or with the baryons. Okay, and so that's one of the strongest constraints that we have on dark matter scattering. And this is at a velocity scale uh, that's you know roughly a percent or maybe a little bit less percent uh, the speed of light. So again, that's very relevant to what's happening in the early universe um, because in the early universe, things are moving very fast, right? So, um, anything that would have thermalized the dark matter or any kind of process that was happening in the early universe um, at these velocity scales, you had better make sure that it's not gonna violate the bullet cluster constraints, okay? So the upshot from this part of the discussion uh, is that dark matter uh, can't be interacting very much in the early universe, otherwise we would have noticed it by now, okay? So let me just do a quick recap of what we've done so far, just because I know we've talked about a lot of observables so far. So, you know, if you don't remember all of the observables we've talked about, that's totally fine. But I want to just make sure that everyone remembers the ramifications of what we know so far. OK, so first of all, we know that the abundance of dark matter has to be roughly 25 percent of the critical density. We saw that pie chart coming from uh, baryon acoustic oscillation, so we know uh, the unique effects that dark matter has on the uh, sound waves of the early universe. And we also separately have information about, uh, you know, we have independent knowledge of the baryon uh, density versus the total matter density. Okay, so all of these things are concordant with each other. Um, and so the abundance of dark matter is one of the best measured properties that we know about the dark matter, actually. Okay, so that's one really important clue as to what the dark matter is doing. We know that the dark matter uh, can't be thermal and relativistic during BBN. Uh, otherwise, the Hubble expansion rate is going to be spoiled. Okay, we know that the dark matter can't free stream too much uh, in the early universe. Otherwise, structure is going to get erased on small scales. It's going to affect uh, the formation of low mass subhalos that we observe. Okay, we know that the dark matter can't interact very much. Otherwise, the structure would again get erased or the CMB would get messed up. Uh, and also merging clusters would look completely different. So as far as we can tell so far, it seems like the dark matter is completely inert. And then finally, uh, this is a point that I haven't really made explicitly yet, um, but it's an important one. And that's the fact that you know dark matter has to have a very, very long uh, lifetime. Okay, so tau has to be much, much longer than the age of the universe because um, we see evidence for dark matter in the very early universe. We also see evidence for dark matter today at redshift zero. For example, all of these dwarf galaxies that we go out and observe in our backyard in the Milky Way. Okay, so we know that whatever is making up the dark matter, it has to be quite stable, 
All right, so that's that's the list of requirements that we have so far. Um, I want to also just talk about some additional requirements that you can place. Uh, you can constrain uh, the, the mass essentially of dark matter constituents. OK, so um, one way that you can do that, and this is just this is very this is kind of the most uh, this is kind of the dumbest way that you could possibly constrain this question. But you can say, well, you know, on the very high mass uh, end, you know, if I look at these sort of low mass uh, dark matter dominated objects like these uh, like Eridanus 2 like these like these low mass dwarf galaxies I had better make sure that these systems are not a, a fraction of a dark matter particle right there has to be at least one dark matter particle in this system and here I'm using particle in, in quotation marks because at these scales it's it's probably not a particle anymore um, but whatever's making up the dark matter it has to probably be lighter than around 10 to the five solar masses. Otherwise, you're gonna have systems that are have a fraction of a dark matter in it, and that does not make sense, okay? So that's a very sort of dumb constraint you can put on the high mass end. So um, what about the low mass end? And in that case, it actually depends on the spin statistics of the dark matter, okay? So let's first tackle the case of uh, dark matter being a boson. So if the dark matter is a boson, then on very, very small, uh, mass scales, it can actually exhibit macroscopic wave-like behavior. And that's just simply boils down to the fact uh, that the de Broglie wavelength uh, of dark matter uh, scales like one over the mass for non-relativistic dark matter. Okay, so the lighter you make this dark matter, the larger you make this de Broglie wavelength. And so if you really take the idea very seriously, um, if you start going down to masses of order 10 to the minus 21 EV, um, you're going to start to have the de Broglie wavelength of dark matter being manifest on the scale of dark matter subhalos. Okay, so that's a quite extreme, uh, quite extreme range. Okay, um, but it's interesting enough uh, for a variety of reasons uh, relevant for things like you know string theory and so on. I'm not going to go into that, um, but the point being is that this is an interesting kind of possibility, and it, it looks completely different from particle dark matter in terms of clustering. Um, here's a simulation by Philip Mox, uh, sort of show, showing what I mean. So here in this leftmost plot, we have an ordinary particle dark matter candidate. Um, you see you have these kind of clusters over here uh, on small scales. And in the right sort of side, you have this wave dark matter, this dark matter that is not really very well described by a particle on the scales that are being resolved by the simulation. And um, what's happening is you can see that a lot of these structures that were over here are not present over here, which is perhaps surprising because these two simulations were uh, initialized with the same initial condition, same cosmology and so forth. In the end, these two systems look quite different. Okay, so what's going on? Uh, well, again, here we have our old friend, the transfer function. Again, that's the ratio of the power spectrum compared to cold dark matter. And we can see that for this wave-like dark matter uh, on large scale, so small k, this ratio is unity. But on very short weight, uh, length scales, high K, we see a suppression in the transfer function. So what's happening is that you suppress, again, structures on uh, very, very small scales. And that's essentially to do with the uncertainty principle, right? You can't actually, in, in this wave-like dark matter picture, you can't actually localize uh, these dark matter particles into this box that you're trying to localize it into, because that would violate the uncertainty principle uh, if the wavelength is bigger than this region. So you're erasing uh, structures below a particular length scale. And uh, that has to do also with, uh, in, this, in this picture, you end up having effectively a scale dependent uh, sound speed because of the uncertainty principle. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, as a secondary effect, you end up with these smaller scale ripples over here. Uh, and that's to do with uh, different waves interfering with each other. So very, very fascinating uh, different behavior. But the upshot is that, again, because we're very good at constraining this transfer function, we're very good at measuring these days uh, small scale things. Uh, we know that because we said they exist, we can't really be in this picture where things are totally wave-like, otherwise structures that we would see are not gonna be there. Okay, so that's sort of a, a lower bound uh, on the mass of dark matter if it's a boson of around 10 to the minus 21 EV. Okay, so that's, that's where that uh, limit actually comes from. Uh, the situation is actually quite different if the dark matter is a fermion 
Um, in that case, you can actually make a much stronger uh, claim uh, because of the poly exclusion principle. And this is related to some, uh, some points that were originally raised uh, by Tremaine and Gunn in 1979. So this is a rather old argument. Um, so let me, let me just try to um, you know, not, not be too fancy, but uh, try to do an order of magnitude estimate of what we can say uh, you know, about poly exclusion in this context, okay? So let's consider a small halo. So for a small halo, the number of states available is gonna be the phase space volume of the system divided by uh, basically the volume of a phase space cell. Cell, okay? So that's gonna be equal to the volume of my system, the volume times whatever the mass of my particle is, I'm gonna call it mx uh, times v cubed. And then I'm gonna take that and divide it by h bar cubed. Okay, because this h bar cubed is sort of the uh, the quantum limit of, of how of how tightly we can pack fermions together. Okay, and ideally, I would like this to be equal to I would like this to be equal to the mass of a of a halo divided by uh, the the mass of the particles that I'm talking about, right? Because that's telling me the number of of particles in my system, and I would like to saturate the number of states available with the number of particles that I in fact have. Okay, so you would you would like you would like this to equal this. Okay, so if you set them equal to each other and you solve for mx, uh, you then find that so mx to the fourth has to be equal to uh, m halo times h bar cubed over uh, the volume volume times uh, v cubed. Okay, so now. Um, you can just take basically, you know, your smallest, um, most you know, squished astrophysical system that you know about. Um, for example, you could take uh, one of these dwarf galaxies or these very small dark matter halos that we've we've been discussing today. Okay, so for example, for one of those, the halo mass is roughly ten to the nine solar masses. Uh, the typical speed is roughly ten kilometers per second, and the volume is like one kiloparsec cubed. Okay. So if you take these numbers and you plug them into Wolfram Alpha and you solve for what m chi has to be or mx has to be, uh, you find that mx has to be bigger than, uh, or, you know, this is an approximate bigger than, uh, around 300 eV. Okay. Uh, and this turns out to be very close to the real answer. So we just did, this was just an estimate that we did just to try to, you know, get a ballpark sense. Uh, the real answer, the real constraint is within a factor of two of this. Okay, so we know that um, if you try to squeeze in light or dark matter into these halos, you're going to violate the poly exclusion principle. Okay, so if dark matter is a fermion, it has to be heavier than like roughly 300 eV. Okay, so quite different from the boson case. Uh, we have 300 versus 10 to the minus 21. Um, so that's, that's uh, quite a big difference. Okay. All right, so what we're left with, so the big picture in terms of the dark matter mass, the big picture that we're left with looks something like this, okay? Again, on the very, very high mass end, we're basically saying we don't want our smallest dark matter dominated objects to be comprised of a fraction of a dark matter particle. Um, on the low mass end, it depends. Uh, so if you have, have a fermion, then you have this Tremaine gun bound, which corresponds to a mass scale roughly of a keV. Um, if you're a boson, then you're going to be down at 10 to the minus 21 eV. Okay, and if you go to, in this boson case, this is roughly 90 orders of magnitude here that you're spanning in terms of the allowed range of dark matter masses. Ah, is there, there's a question I see. Um, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi. So uh, I got a bit confused. It might be a slightly naive question, but uh, the fact that there is a minimum cell size HQ isn't, uh, I mean, I believe that this, this just comes from the uncertainty principle. And isn't this true irrespective of whether you are treating fermions or bosons? 
Ah, but with bosons, you're allowed to you're allowed to put multiple uh, bosons into the same quantum state. So that that quantum state, which has that volume of h uh, h bar cubed, you're not allowed to do that with fermions. So you have a maximum occupation number of two corresponding to the two spins of the fermions. Uh, but the av available number of states will be same, right? For um, the available number of states will be the same, but the available number of particles will not be the same because, you, like I said, you can put multiple bosons into the same quantum states, but you can't do that to fermions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, yeah, the number of states in the coarse grained way is the same, but the number of particles is very much not. So, so the step where I set the number of states equal to m halo over the mass for bosons, that would not be okay. Yeah, there's another question. Anshum, unmute and speak, please. Hello. So uh, primordial black holes, which can also be, uh, uh, also form the supermassive black holes and as well as the intermediate mass black holes via merging. So can these be a good candidate for dark matter? And what are the current uh, observational data to support this? Yeah, good. You'll see here on this uh, plot, I have PBHs. So um, that's right. That is a dark matter candidate. Uh, I'm not going to go into the um, observations of this right now, but, uh, but perhaps in a, in a future lecture. Okay. All right. There are no All right, questions so, at this stage. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, all right, like I said, so yeah, this is a huge range that we have. Uh, it depends a little bit. So if it's a, a, if it's a boson, you have 90 orders of magnitude. Um, it's, if it's a fermion, you have more like 60 or 70 orders of magnitude, but it's really a huge uh, space of possibilities. And I'm already, I've already implicitly made a really big simplifying assumption. I've already implicitly assumed that dark matter is only one thing. But that need not be the case. It could be that dark matter is multiple things, in which case the bounds that I just told you about um, can be significantly weakened and the parameter space can be opened up even more. Okay, so this, um, this is kind of a potentially very daunting uh, challenge then as to the question of what is the dark matter and what is it doing in the early universe? Um, because these different regions of this mass parameter space I've shaded them according to qualitatively different kinds of behavior. Okay, so yeah, as someone just asked about, um, at the very, very high mass end, um, it doesn't really make sense anymore to necessarily talk uh, about dark matter as being made of particles. It makes more sense to talk about uh, primordial black holes or other kinds of compact objects at this mass scale. Okay, so that's one, uh, that's one qualitatively different kind of candidate. Um, moving down in mass, you have composite dark matter, um, which can do interesting things. It can have all these interesting uh, non-elastic interactions, or it can fuse, and it can do all these crazy things. So that's um, super interesting. We have the classic WIMP window, uh, which I'm going to be going into. Um, I was hoping to get into it a little bit today, but I'm running a little low on time. So probably mostly going to talk about that next time. Um, but it's this window sort of stops out around 1 GeV. There's this famous Lee Weinberg bound that we'll talk about in the next lecture. Uh, moving down to even lighter uh, dark matter candidates, uh, we have the so-called light dark sectors um, and sterile neutrinos. Uh, and these are generally speaking, these are thermal candidates uh, in this window, but they're not WIMPs per se. Although as we saw, they have to effectively behave like cold dark matter or like WIMPs by a certain time in the uh, evolution of the history of the universe. Um, and then going down to these very, very uh, light mass scales where because of the Tremaine gun bound, we know that if dark matter exists in this region, it has to be a boson. And in this case, um, the occupation number of these bosons is really high. Like we just talked about, um, the number of particles in any individual quantum state is quite high. And in that regime, uh, it doesn't really make sense to talk about particle dark matter anymore because uh, similar to how if you have a high occupation number of photons, then those photons behave uh, like, like classical Maxwell's equations, classical waves. Similarly, when we have a high occupation number of these bosons as dark matter, uh, they also behave more like a field or more like a wave. Okay, so that's, that's sort of true of this entire mass range, although the sort of relevant length scale of that wave is a strong function of the dark matter mass. Um, 
You also have in this uh, region, the classic QCD axion window. Okay, we're gonna talk about that. And this extends all the way down until the point where you erase structure, uh, as I mentioned. Okay, so there's a huge range of different possibilities here. Um, these different possibilities have qualitatively very different behaviors over this entire range, um, which is why, uh, at least for me in my research, I really like to employ a strategy of really throwing the kitchen sink at this problem, um, really trying to use every imaginable system that I can get my hands on because there's such a wide diversity of different theories here. So there's not really gonna be uh, a one size fits all approach that we can employ to constrain all of these qualitatively different types of theories, okay? So um, that's a little bit daunting. So how are we gonna approach this really huge space, right? So maybe you see this and you say, okay, 90 orders of magnitude, that's too much. We're never gonna solve this thing. So I'm gonna just give up. I'm gonna have an existential crisis and I'm gonna go to industry. Okay, that's, that's, one, uh, that's one possibility. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you don't uh, have an existential crisis because of, because of dark matter. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna reject that one. So, so you know, no, All right? What else? Uh, what else can we do? We can try to be very phenomenological, which is something that I, uh, like I just said, tend to do, uh, especially, it's especially a good approach to be very phenomenological when we are rich in data. So you can just say, you can just start posing questions like, what if dark matter was like this? What if it interacted like that? What if it had this weird property? And you can then go out and look for it in the data um, and really make it not a hypothetical question, but a question that is part of the scientific method, one that you can confront with observation. That's another approach. Um, a third approach, which can be related to the second approach, um, is you can try to explain uh, surprises in uh, data. You know, so various anomalies uh, where you have some unexpected signal, you can try to say, oh, well, maybe that unexpected signal is related to what's happening with dark matter. Um, and this is, I would call this uh, ambulance chasing kind of approach. Um, there's some, uh, you know, examples in recent years of uh, these kinds of anomalies, which have spurred um, a lot of inspiration in dark matter model building. Uh, including various excesses at low threshold direct detection experiments. Um, we have various uh, indirect detection uh, kind of surprises. Uh, there's this inner galaxy GEV excess in gamma rays. Um, we have various X-ray lines coming from different, you know, dark matter dominated systems, which is perhaps a little surprising. So maybe that's some signal of dark matter doing something interesting. Who knows? Um, we have all these, you know, terrestrial experiment kind of anomalies. Um, for example, these short baseline neutrino anomalies, we have mu on G minus two. Um, we have various flavor anomalies. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm of an age where uh, there was the 750 GeV diphoton excess um, in, you know, what was it, 2015 or 2016? Um, that was a big topic when I was a student. Okay, so that was a big one, but I, I didn't include that here, obviously, but I, I would have included it on this list if it was a few years ago. Okay, we have um, the Hubble tension, so a big cosmological anomaly. Uh, we also have um, some surprising properties of dwarf galaxies um, and, their, and their properties. So this is just a, a range of kind of qualitatively different types of anomalies, um, ranging from terrestrial experiment to uh, basically traditional particle astrophysics, looking at like gamma rays and high energy neutrinos, uh, terrestrial experiments, cosmology, and galaxy physics. So dark matter is able to really touch upon all of these different kinds of qualitatively different uh, observables. So that's uh, a lot of really rich physics coming into play. Um, so that can be really constraining for a theory of dark matter. Uh, okay, another approach uh, when you try to think about possibilities for what dark matter is doing is you can try to make dark matter part of a solution uh, to other known issues with the standard model. Okay, so in other words, just trying to be very diplomatic, solving multiple problems at the same time with one approach, trying to make everybody happy, right? So we know that there are problems with the standard model. Uh, we have the hierarchy problem in the electroweak sector. Uh, we have the strong CP problem, which we're gonna touch on both of these points. Um, also neutrino masses are still not explained in standard model. So lots of theories of dark matter actually simultaneously try to address some of these points, okay? Uh, a final approach is really just to focus on explaining things that we already know, not trying to speculate too much. We're not trying to, you know, marry together two separate ideas, but really just trying to focus on what are the things that we can actually measure um, and that we can explain. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's the approach uh, that I'm going to be focusing on uh, for the rest of my lectures. Okay, so that's going to be the focus of uh, the rest of today as well as um, tomorrow and Wednesday. Okay, and in doing that, uh, the the best measured property of dark matter is the cosmological abundance. So that's where we're going to start. Okay. So that's the big picture. Um, is it is it clear to everyone before we get into talking about abundances? I see that there was another thing in the chat. I can't quite see what the what the Just comment was. Give me a minute. Uh, what's the difference between the primordial black holes and the dark matter halos? Ah, good. Um, the primordial black holes are would be the constituents of dark matter. So that would be the the smallest piece that you can break up the dark matter into. Um, whereas the dark matter halos are just big clumps of dark matter. We don't know if it's, you know, we don't know if it's 10 dark matter constituents or 10 to the, you know, a bazillion. We don't know. All we can tell is there's some clump of dark matter there and we can tell from gravity, but we can't tell what is the, we can't tell what the, the constituents are or how many particles there are. There is another raise hand, uh, Cyan, can you unmute and ask your question? Yeah, so I had a question about the uh, the interaction of dark matter in the early universe where you were showing the uh, gravitational veil because of the baryonic and the dark matter. So uh, there you said that, so we know that the dark, even though it doesn't interact with the uh, standard model sector, but it gravitates and hence it uh, modulates the density uh, of perturbation and the temperature fluctuations, right? And you said that uh, it uh, affects the odd number of peaks. Uh, I was not uh, I'm not clear. It was not clear to me what you meant by that. Ah, yeah, good. Whoops. Sorry. I bet by day three, I'll get the hang of this. Okay. So let's look at the power spectrum again. Just slide, find the right slide. Here it is. Okay. So um, again, this is not, um, these are not CMB oriented lectures. So, um, you know, I didn't want to go into a ton of detail, but maybe I can explain a little bit better now. So what we're looking at when we look at the CMB uh, power spectrum, we're looking at uh, fluctuations as a function of angular scale, as a function of multiple moment, okay? But what, what do we mean when we say we're talking about these temperature fluctuations? Well, we're looking at sort of a uh, temperature fluctuation uh, correlation of those things squared. So in other words, we're looking at a variance, right? Um, so any, anything that's going to have a lot of variance in it is going to manifest itself as looking uh, very, very high in this plot, right? So these peaks here correspond to, you know, some scales in the universe where there's a lot of variance, okay? Now, um, on these large scales over here, uh, that actually corresponds to a physical length scale where between the Big Bang and recombination, um, sound waves, so these, these sound waves that I, that I talked about at a cartoon level, um, they only have time to come together once and then recombination happens and they're just, they're just frozen at that phase. That's the phase that we see them at. Um, and so that's a compression peak because that's the, that's the uh, distance scale where things have had enough time since the Big Bang to come together once and compress. And then boom, recombination happens. We see, it, we see that compression. Okay, so that's, that's going to lead to a lot of variation on these scales, right? Because some regions are going to have a lot of stuff compressed into one region. Other regions are going to be empty because all the stuff that was that used to be there got compressed into this one other little region. Okay. Um, uh, you know, alternatively, this next peak where you have a lot of variation is a rarefaction. Okay, so that's kind of corresponding to okay. So between the Big Bang and recombination, things had enough time to kind of come together once. Um, actually, they've had enough time to then turn around. Uh, rare faction has started to set in. So, you know, um, photon pressure has forced things to move apart, but now it's moving apart and it's gotten to the point where it's ready to turn back around. So now radiation pressure, because the density has dropped, radiation pressure is no longer as formidable. And so gravity wins again. So things have moved out and they're just starting to turn around and trying to fall back in when, boom, recombination happens and it's frozen at that phase. Okay, and each of these subsequent peaks over here corresponds to a different, um, you know, iteration of that cycle. Um, so these peaks correspond to the times there when you have a snapshot at a compression or a snapshot at a rarefaction. The odd ones correspond to the compressions 
and the even ones correspond to the rare factions. So if you're enhancing the odd peaks, uh, that's telling you that you have an enhanced compression. And what that's doing is it's increasing the variance that you see, which means that you have a bigger uh, signal uh, in terms of this y-axis over here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sian. Uh, Tripti, there are a couple of more questions. Tripti, okay. uh, unmute and go ahead and ask your question, please. Yeah, hi, my question is like, you mentioned about the dark radiation. So I just want to know what is dark radiation? Like, does it have any particular feature than radiation? Oh, good question. So dark radiation is um, not a necessary ingredient, but it's a feature of many theories of dark matter. So in particular theories of dark matter where uh, perhaps the dark matter is not the only new particle, maybe there are other new particles uh, that exist in nature. For example, in the case of dark radiation, if you have some new dark force that's mediated by uh, a light force carrier, which is not one of the force carriers that we know about in the standard model, so it's not you know, photons or something, it's some new thing. Okay, so that's we're gonna call that dark radiation. And that dark radiation is not the dark matter. Okay, because if it were the dark matter and if it were behaving as radiation, uh, then whoops, sorry. Yeah, if it were the dark matter and it were behaving as radiation, then you would mess up this BBN issue that we talked about. So whatever this dark matter, or excuse me, whatever this dark radiation is doing, it can't have a really high thermal abundance. Otherwise, it's going to contribute uh, to real radiation. Okay, so this is just some uh, perhaps bath or perhaps it's a very diffuse amount of uh, these force carriers. Um, and in these theories where you have these force carriers and if they are populated cosmologically, the dark matter can, in principle, interact with the force carriers. So it's um, it's not a ubiquitous feature of all theories of dark matter. It's just present in some theories of dark matter. Um, and its presence can do interesting things um, to what the dark matter is doing and how it's clustering. You can get the equivalent of baryon acoustic oscillations, but the dark matter version. So the, oh my gosh, I swear I'll get the hang of this. Uh, the cartoon picture I showed over here if you have dark radiation, then the dark matter is gonna do a similar thing as what the photon baryon fluid is doing. So that can um, have an effect on how dark matter clusters, um, which can then later have a gravitational impact on how baryons cluster. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Drupti. Um, Anshu, can you unmute and ask your question? Uh, hello. So. Uh, since a high concentration of dark matter halos uh, can affect the light curves and the photometry coming from the stars and galaxies. So is there any effect of dark matter halos to the direct distance uh, me measurements to the galaxies? Because if yes, uh, so it can have some impacts on distance ladder measurements and may put some constraint regarding the abultation. Yeah, good question. Um, so sorry, just to clarify. So you, you, I think you said rotation curve or, or light curve and you maybe meant, meant them interchangeably. No, no, the light curve and the photometries uh, from that we measure the distances. Uh, the, like for example, let's say parallax. Mm -hmm. So um, good. So dark matter can't affect parallax because that's a, that's a purely geometric uh, distance measure. But I think maybe what you're getting at is, well, what if dark matter can interact with light at some very small level? Um, and can that actually affect, uh, yeah, determinations of distance that come from basically the inverse squared law of light of how flux falls off with distance? The answer is actually no, um, just because all of the constraints that I've already mentioned on uh, the degree to which dark matter can interact uh, with, with light or with baryons, um, that really kind of sets a pretty strong limit on uh, the extent to which dark matter can uh, be opaque to light. Okay, so um, in particular, this was actually kind of a, um, I, don't, I don't know if I would say trendy, but it was a hot, hotter topic, I would say, yeah, in the early 2000s, closer to when um, uh, dark energy was discovered. So people thought, oh, maybe this could explain dark energy. Like maybe the reason things that are farther away, maybe the reason that they look dimmer is because there's some attenuation uh, due to, for, for example, dark matter. Um, and that turned out to not really be viable uh, with other kind of constraints on how dark matter is interacting. Because if dark matter was interacting with light, then in this cartoon picture that I'm showing here, um, it would also be affected by radiation pressure. Um, it turns out also um, there's other kind of more subtle ways that dark matter can interact with light that's not just scattering. Uh, those tend to go in the opposite direction though. So they tend to actually make the Hubble tension worse. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you, Anshu. Thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions now, Kathleen. Um, ah, okay, well, I was at a very good stopping point in terms of my notes. So um, if there's no more questions, then I think I will just um, leave this up just in case it inspires anyone else to have any last minute questions um, and we'll continue tomorrow. Absolutely, sounds good. Let me just ask around if there is any other question. Students, if you have any further questions, raise your hand, there is Simon. Uh, yeah, yeah, you sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I had one more question. Huh? Yeah, so go in ahead. the uh, Lyman Alpha Forest, the animation that you were showing, uh, there there was this sudden dip in the absorption line. So I don't understand in, uh, the whole thing, like uh, as yeah, it let's was look expanding. At the movie again. Mm -hmm. I didn't sorry, understand. So yeah. So the dip you're talking about is which dip? The around th thousand, yeah. Later, ah, later that's, after the that's expansion. Lyman beta. Yeah. So that's the Lyman beta line. Um, we tend to not focus on that so much uh, because essentially yeah, here. Uh, okay. it's harder to observe. Uh, the wavelengths that are relevant for that are hard to observe from the ground. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you can in principle, you can in principle do the same story uh, that I showed here with any spectral line. Um, so that's actually kind of uh, that's actually a big topic right now in observational cosmology is doing line intensity mapping. So 21 centimeter cosmology is actually an example of that. But you can also look at other atomic lines like the CO line is another good example. Um, it traces uh, galaxy formation very well. Um, so CO intensity mapping is another uh, thing people do to try to measure um, structure formation. But Lyman alpha is really the gold standard for now. It's really the, the most well studied one. So that's, um, that's what we have for now. But yeah, in principle, you can do this with every line. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Cyan. Any further questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Professor Schutz again. Uh, thank you, thank you, Kathleen. Um, we'll okay. see you all tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, students, we join in about uh, you know, 25 to 27 minutes for the next lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Bye.